Welcome to the Global Conversations webcast. I'm your host, Andre Darmanin. We create bridges to connect with thought leaders from diverse backgrounds, from different sectors around the world. Together, we will uncover new insights, broaden your perspectives, and share innovative solutions. Get ready. So hi there. Um, so today is my uh, is the first episode of the third season of Global Conversations, and I have two well-known esteemed guests in the global uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion space. Um, and, you know, I've known them for, I don't know, Sammy, Rose, I think it's been about two years since that that conference, pandemic time. So we're still virtual. We're still on other parts of the world. But uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's been great over these last couple of years to, to get to know the both of you uh, in the space, whether through social media or through personal conversations. And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, let's, uh, you know, one of the things that we started to, uh, start to talk about in this, in this work is, uh, toxic masculinity. And of course, given the nature of what's been going on in the world, which we'll touch base on, uh, in a little bit, um, you know, I want to see where, where this goes and, you know, we'll just go with the flow with the conversation and, uh, and definitely, you know, um, this is going to be something that's going to be an excellent conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, without further ado, uh, let's get into the little niceties, getting to know each other, get, let the audience get to know who you are. So, um, you know, so Rose, let's start with you. I mean, you know, like I said, I've, you know, I've known you for a couple of years, uh, through our conversations and, uh, and yeah, and one of the things, um, one of the things that really struck me about you is your, you know, is your candor and your candidness, especially, uh, you know, your experience uh, navigating this space, whether in, you know, whether in the company space or in the private sector, and especially that, I know we mentioned uh, briefly about, uh, you know, your your appearance, I believe was on Nadia's, uh, Nadia Nagamutu's um, uh, podcast, uh, Why Care? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, when you talked about your lived experience and, and why you change careers, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, that was where we started. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I'd like to give the floor to you and, you know, tell us, uh, about your story, um, you know, how you got into the EDI space, et cetera. And yeah. Absolutely. So thanks for having me on and Sammy, I'm glad we get to chat once in a while. We're both so busy. We never... We never get the chance. So thank you, Andre, for making this happen. Yeah. So how did I get into EDI? I sort of fell into this space. I have to say it's not something that I I've always been interested in, but it was never something I pursued as a career. So I have, you know, my my academic preparation is in marketing. I have an MBA in marketing and I worked for in the corporate world for American Express um, for, for many years in marketing in New York City. But then I met and married an Italian and moved to Italy and we started our own business. So we started a pharmaceutical business. We were, that sounds much more glamorous than how we started. It was literally three of us in an office sort of getting things happening. And over the years, it grew um, and I loved it. Uh, in 2011, it became too big to be a privately owned company. So we looked at options and in the end, we decided to sell it. So in 2011, at the age of 47, I retired. And uh, that was that sounds really great until you actually sit down and you say, look, what it, what is it that I'm doing with, with my life, right? And I realize now what a great um, time it was. So I, 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 you know, with a lot of discipline, um, I kind of said no to job opportunities that came my way to really think through what is it that I wanted to be when I grew up because most of us don't get that chance. So I didn't want to just jump into the next job. And I was lucky because let's face it, it's luck to be able to have the time and space to afford to do that. Um, and then what happened is I realized that the thing that consistently kept coming up for me was this idea of um, executive coaching or helping people realize and be their full selves, but also working and delivering. And it seemed that there were two chasms. So I paid my way through business school um, by being a teaching assistant in what in those days in the late 80s and early 90s was called group and interpersonal dynamics, which today is called leadership development, um, emotional intelligence, you know, all of that stuff was kind of just chucked in. Anyway, so I um, 
I realized, you know, even when we had our own company, the kind of training I could give my managers were always sort of technical training. And even the soft skills were not about helping them bring out their natural leadership abilities, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I went back to school, got certified in emotional intelligence. I have a new, uh, I have a brain-based coaching degree that I re-upskilled. So I did all of that. And since then, I have been working full-time in advising C-suite, but actually leadership teams. And now I'm actually working with, with entrepreneurs leading, or I would say scale-ups more than startups, but um, uh, boards in leading. Now, the thing with leading is in a world, as you all know, that's changing so quickly and yeah. technology and all of this changing, you know, that the very tenet of what it means to be a leader has changed because it used to be like you got promoted because you were the smartest and the brightest and you knew everything. You were the smartest person in the room. And now what's happening is there's a lot of young people, people from different countries, different functions who know a lot more about any given matter than you. No one person, you know, can have all that knowledge. So the, the nature of leadership is changing. So by definition, a leader, one of the leader's biggest abilities, let's say, or new abilities, if they want to keep leading, is to be able to hear different voices, mm -hmm. to make it easy for people to speak, um, to not have toxic environments or non-psychologically safe environments. So I came in through DEI through that. And of course, then it builds. So now I'm on European Women on Boards and I'm doing all kinds of um, uh, of different things. But anyway, that's my long winded story of how I got to where I am. Yeah, no, thanks, Rose. Um, and now, what can I say about you, Sam? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we kind of run the same circles in in a lot of ways. I mean, first through the through the uh, uh, through the conference. I can't even remember what the what the conference was. It was so long, um, you know. In your presentation uh, that you made, um, you know, back then, I think I still have it somewhere in my in my drive. Um, but uh, but at the same time, Sammy Sammy Ben Ali. I mean, what more can I say? I mean, you're you. you know I've we we talk about a lot of things and and I want to go back to as we dive into our conversation about about football or soccer because there was something that rose um you know yeah, we, we there something there but Sammy you know tell tell everyone about yourself your um your journey into uh into DEI and and whatnot thank you thanks uh, thanks for, thanks for the invite I love that as well Rose I, I learned uh, I learn more from you every single time uh, we speak so it's great to speak again and I, I love that um that journey and path that you presented, which I think is amazing. From if I can sort of go along the same lines, how did I get into it? Um, more from the talent acquisition HR route, which is obviously the more traditional route that a lot of people have gone gone through um, ID and E. But the more I've reflected on it, the more I've I've worked in this space over the years. The the more I'm not I'm not a person that's um, a person of faith, shall we say? Uh, but interestingly, it's almost like maybe it was fate in terms of I got to this point, and and I'll explain a bit more about that. So I, I reflected more on my background. So I grew up in a household where my mother is white Irish Catholic, large family. Uh, my father is a practicing Muslim from Tunisia. He came over in the seventies. Again, huge family, both sides. Grew up in a small town in the northwest of England, uh, and back then it was. You don't know what you don't know. You, you, I'm used. To, I was used to growing up in that environment. Used to going to Tunisia, culturally hugely different. And then I've returned back from my summer holiday over there, which was less of a holiday and more a, a test of endurance. Um, and and those experiences, and then seeing how how different they were at the time, and and that understanding of being included and sense of belonging in different environments and how you have to listen to other people's stories and how you sometimes look to either code switch or be different in certain environments and I never knew, used to see that as a strength it was something I almost used to hide as I was growing up and the more I grew uh, grew up and had experience studying in the US as well as obviously the UK living in the Middle East you put all those things into practice whether it be cultural intelligence, EQ, uh, and and those things that I never really used to put a value on, or pro possibly in the corporate world, there wasn't as much value on it as as there is now. And understanding what leadership used to look like and how things are massively changing, uh, multi generation, multiculturalism, 
uh, and all that all that all those good things in uh, that we're seeing come to prominence now in in our work that sort of led me to this space through working with underrepresented and underserved communities and creating opportunities for others which has really led me into this work and what, what I've been doing for for a while now uh, and, I've, and I and I do consider myself lucky to to have a job with, which is ultimately a passion but I do find myself quite you know I know, I know it's a touchy word but I do find myself quite privileged that I can lean upon those experiences that I've had that serve me well in in the roles that I do and get to meet interesting and amazing people such as yourselves and, and wider so hopefully that gives a bit of a whirlwind journey for me. Oh thanks for that Sammy and uh, for and Rose as well for uh, letting us uh, hear your stories lived experiences and and how you got into this work uh, because you know getting into this work we all come from different backgrounds um, you know Sammy's background you know, is 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 kind of the traditional way that everyone has gone on, but you know, people like myself and and Rose, it's been a different path, and but it's based a lot on lived experiences. So, let's dive into the conversation a little bit here uh, about what we're trying to what we're going to be talking about on tax, toxic masculinity, um, and that's a you know that's a broad based term uh, that is uh, that has been couched uh, in today's circle. It might be uh, not necessarily uh, the trend, the, the, tr well, it is the trend that's going on and how do we, uh, have equality and equity in the workplace and within society itself. And, you know, let's, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things here. So, you know, Rose, as I, as I got to know you, one of the things that I, I remember seeing this vivid picture of you, I think you took a picture of a, of a soccer slash football match. Um, I can't remember where it was, it was on, on Instagram or something like that. And I've like I can't remember which Italian team it was that you're that you or your husband supported. Inter. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, we can't we can't talk about that because I'm I'm for Syria I'm Juventus. And oh, for, oh, oh, you see, oh, you see. Oh, and, for, and for and this for and this is trouble. For, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and uh, and yeah, and then of course you know with Sammy we have our little chats over WhatsApp about about you know clubs and stuff, and of course the odd funny thing that goes on in, in the football world and uh you know him being Newcastle and me being a Chelsea fan oh. or supporter. Yeah, I'm Chelsea too Sammy sorry yeah, oh, so I'm not in the good books right now this might be a short call <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so you know and you know as we talk about the love of the sport the love of the game there's always been this challenge you know and, and it seems very interesting that this is this is happening in you know, it happened during the World Cup. And of course, I'm sure everyone has heard as we're recording this about all that's been going on in Spain lately. For some reason, it's Spain about the reporter, about, uh, you know, about Rubiales uh, being, um, you know, having his incident of kissing a, uh, uh, I can't think, I think it's Jenny Perdoso, I think her name oh, is uh, from the Spanish uh, football team, the national football team. But that whole three weeks of, denial and and saying and not and refusing to step down um you know that kind of puts you know that kind of puts everything into perspective of you know where is you know where is this machismo that that happens and why does it continuously happen and and you know and these are things that that you know, that that concern uh men in general um, you know, so, I mean, I want to get your take on, on what exactly your thoughts were when you saw that incident play out, uh, up to the point where he finally resigned. I mean, we all heard about to his mother locking, uh, locking herself into a church, you know, um, saying that, uh, she was, uh, you know, she was defending her, her, uh, her son saying that he did no wrong, everything about culture, like all of that. So anyway, I want to get both your takes on 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 that incident and how that kind of plays out not on the work not only in general but also in the workplace. So, um, I don't know, Rose, do you want to start off with that? Well, I'd love the man's perspective first, if that's okay, sure, Sammy. Yeah. I don't mean to be yeah. passing yeah, the buck, but no, no, no. Um, it was um, watching it unfold live. I put I, it, it stood out straight away. And I was watching it with my wife and my young daughter. My, my daughter's seven. And um, obviously we were disappointed because England got beat. 
but I, I love watching celebrations at the end. And I remember it stood out straight away, and I was thinking, wow, okay, this, this is a bit, you know. But because we're at, in the work that we're at, I very much try and check myself in terms of, right, okay, you know, why am I thinking and feeling the way I am? You know, you obviously talk about bias, conscious, unconscious. But I was thinking, but first thing I did was check myself to say, okay, what am I, what am I watching? And how am I interpreting it? So at first it was, okay, is this a culture thing? And then viewing the behavior of the individuals involved, how are they reacting? And as it's playing out, it, it was almost like, I'm not sure if if this is actually okay. And I know that sounds ridiculous now, but as I'm watching, I'm like, I'm not sure this is a this is this is reciprocal because obviously it happened to quite a few of the different players. And so at the time it was it was an uncomfortable watch, but at the same time I was like, maybe this is something that they do after the games. Mm. I don't know. And then to obviously see it all happen as it exploded obviously a day or two later, and then uh, obviously from the players saying it wasn't consensual, and I thought, right, okay, well, that's good because they've come out and said this absolutely wasn't, and this is how we feel about it. So then from my point of view, it's like, okay, so, so now we know. And then what then transpired from pretty much gaslighting in terms of, you know, this, that's not how it was, this out and, and the backwards and forwards. And then as these things play out on social media, irrespective of the subject, there always has to be this polarisation and then these camps. And there can never be a... And with some things, there doesn't need to be necessarily a debate because you've just got one person telling you exactly how they felt that wasn't consensual. So for me, it was almost like the story's over, you know, that it, it wasn't right. And I really wanted it to end quite quickly, not because it was uncomfortable, more it, took, it distracted away from the achievement. And that, for me, really made me annoyed because it was almost like this women's achievement, first time they've ever won the World Cup, phenomenal achievement. But but what I'd actually had a conversation with my wife about in while the game was going on was around the relationships had broken down with that coach, not the head of the FA, but actually with the coach. And I remember talking to my wife and my wife was like, well, why are these players still playing for him? And it was quite a good debate while we were, while we were talking about it. So there's obviously those dynamics at play and then for them to come together and galvanise as a team, win it, brilliant, but then totally overshadowed. And so, so for me, it was really interesting how it even became a debate and then it was, and then the cultural element was thrown in and then it was around uh, becoming a, a legal matter. But for me, it, I, it just ratified what I initially felt in terms of felt very uncomfortable, sick about what I was watching wasn't happy about it uh and then almost a bit annoyed with myself that I'd almost checked myself if that made sense it was almost like how why did I even check myself there I knew what I was seeing wasn't right but it was almost like who am I to say if it wasn't or was right so I think a bit of a long-winded way to say it was just really shocking and it was it didn't need to play out the way it did it could for me it was clear cut it wasn't the right thing to do mm -hmm step aside, move on, let's celebrate the win. But now that's all been lost in the noise. And then, you know, the announcement in terms of how he's done the resignation, et cetera, and the manager lost the job before the, the head of the FA. But football for me is a um, a microcosm of not a lot of great stuff, unfortunately, yeah. at, the, at the moment. Rose, your thoughts? So I have a, I, I agree with most of what, what you say and, and, you know, because we, we do similar work, you know, I, I do have a very, very similar approach. Mine is, you know, for me, I, I'm, I'm very, very focused on leader, on leadership and what does it mean? Um, you know, the, the, the world cup is to win the, the world cup in football. Um, and, the job of the leader, whether it's the coach, whether it's the association, whether it's FIFA, whatever, is to ensure best practices for that to happen. And the job of the team players is to use all the tricks they can to do that. And they did. And if this, so part of me watching this, that was fabulous football. I don't, I, I don't know like how much people actually watched the games. I think a lot of people did. And I think, you know, that was amazing football. And particularly for women's football, it was a huge 
jump in quality, which I don't think people talk about a lot. You know, we talk about men's games being faster and stuff. If you looked at that football, that was not that. So I think the biggest tragedy is nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking about this persistence and not just for the finals, by the way, in general, but in the unfolding of the event, I, I agree with Sammy. You have to look at the context. This was a team where a majority of the players, 50% plus, said we have a problem with the coach and the coach was kept in. Why? So you're yeah. asking, um, Andre, what, you know, what does this have to do with the corporate world? We see a lot of that, right? right? We performed. It's an old man's network. What are the criteria? I mean, it would have been much better if they said, here are our criteria for keeping a coach. He's met. 95%, that's why we're keeping. That's transparent, that's clear. Here it's not. So there's a lot of room for murkiness. There was a reaction that frankly, I was with Sammy. I was like, wow, okay. They, you know, I think a kiss on the mouth is kind of very personal, but I am a huggy person. I will hug you often, especially if I've known you and met you. And I don't mean any sexual intent. And I often have to set, you know, check myself. It's, it's, it's a height of emotion. So, but then because, I, so I understand what happened and I have to say, wait, 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 Rose, why are you, you know, the kiss on the mouth just because for you, it's something, but again, it's context. We've got an organization that's already had issues. Um, we've got now a leader who might be excited, but then has issues. And then we've got all the social media that came around it. And there was a lot of fluff about, was she joking about it and the bus or not? Was it yeah. not, was it, what, is this a weird, but understandable, you know, so there was mm -hmm. all of this, blah, blah, blah about it. Once she said, this was not what I wanted. This is, you know, there is no doubt that action should have been taken. Not because it's the right thing to do and we want to, it's because that's a bad leader. Organizations don't lead leaders. You have a rotten leader, everybody suffers. Mm -hmm. So there, there was already, you know, when again, it just showed poor judgment, whether or not you think it was a harmless kiss or a risk kiss or whatever kiss. I have my own opinions, but from a leadership perspective, that's bad judgment, yeah. especially when she spoke out. Now, where I think it got toxic on both sides is the doubling down on, I don't want to hear you, you're wrong. But also on the other side of canceling completely somebody out for behavior that should have had percussions. He sh should have been fired, sent to retraining class, whatever it is that you want to do. But it, what happens is as humans, we don't know, as societies, we don't yet know how to deal with toxicity. Right. We Surgeons know what to do. They take that piece out of our system. Mm -hmm. yeah. As humans, we don't. We just sit and we argue about it. And the, we're, we're, we're calling people out on their behavior rather than calling people in to have a discussion about it and hear about it. And this is what toxicity is about, right? Again, I'm not condoning this guy. The guy should have been gone. I mean, I think the coach should have been gone, you know, so, and, and of course there, there might be reasons to keep it on, but I, I know this is probably not a very popular point of view, but for me, it's like, it just got blown out of discussion. There's no hope now of people listening to each other and changing their minds. So do we want to make people wrong or do we want to learn? Yeah. Often they're not the same thing. And we as societies, as organizations, as groups, we don't know how to stay in both camps at one. And this, I think, is the tragedy of this game. And who, who paid the price? We all did. We all did because finally we reached a level of soccer, which was just mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it took me a while to sit back and let this all play out. You know, when I saw it on social media, what happened, like, I'll, I'll be, I'll be frank. I didn't see what happened. I just heard everything. I heard about what happened and, you know, I'm like you, like I'm very, touchy feely for the most part i'm i you know whether it's my culture whether it's my extroverted slash or i should say i'm more of an ambervert but you know ambiverted nature um and you know so all this calling out calling out calling out is something that i've 
that I've kind of wondered about, you know, why is this continuously happening? And especially within our profession, there's a lot of people that call out people, not call people in. And so how do we get past that? Especially, you know, especially in, in, you know, in the spaces that we're in, where we're trying to have equal voices, equality, equity in the workplace, et cetera, but also at the same time, not condoning this, you know, I guess you can call this form of sexual harassment, uh, if you will. Um, but yeah, all of this doubling down of, you know, that, that becomes the behavior of, of someone who, who is, who is, who has that machismo, right? Now, whether that's cultural or not, I don't know, but, you know, seeing that whole con press conference co happen, I'm just like, you're making yourself, you're making it worse than what it is. But also too, what I, what I found interesting in that conversation is that, you know, um, you know, um, Ms. Pardoso, she was silent for a few days and that kind of plays out in the perspective of mental health. Right. And it's, you know, a lot of people, you know, especially when some, someone is doing something to you, uh, especially as, as women, um, that expects your that affects your mental health because you shut down, and not a lot of people see it, and you know it's invisible. So, you know, I guess the first thing is, you know, I guess to the both of you, we're talking about suppressed feelings for 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 women, uh, also even from from the perspective of men too. It's like why do they act out the way they do, or even in the case of being affected by situations, why do they suppress their feelings? So it's so there's two ways of of not necessarily two ways of thinking about there's but there's both a gender perspective on this. So um, you yeah. know, like for the both of you, your your thoughts on that as well. I think um I think if you put a you know you can I like the way Rose has used the experience to then match it to, to what happens in the corporate world. Because if you look at that now as an example, what has anyone learned from it? Nothing really, yeah. but, but there's been some bad learning in terms of, you know, that could have gone up much, much better from a learning in terms of both camps. So you got, because what then happens is we then, you got the camp that were like, well, he's done nothing wrong. He said he's not done anything wrong. And then now look, a man's lost his, this man's lost his job and they've cancelled him. And then you got the other camp that said, look how long it took to get to that. And there's no no dialogue in between, which could have been worked on much earlier in terms of what was your, you know, why did you take the actions you did at the moment, but also following it? Because it's almost like who's advising these people sometimes? Because and from the cultural point of view, Rose mentioned before, I like John Amici's quote around, you know, um, a culture is defined by the worst behavior tolerated. You know, and that just stood out then, because then you're like, are you saying then that that is tolerated? Because you've already had an issue previously with the manager prior to the tournament. So again, it, with, with managers, we've all known managers with track records and history within an organisation that are allowed to have a bit of a scorched earth policy and still get away with it and set that culture and tone. And so what that does is then feelings aren't spoken about, aren't shared, which then touch upon burnout, mental health issues and then exacerbate. And for me, it's just constantly missed opportunities to learn on all sides, because there's so much nuance sometimes in a lot of these, in a in a lot of these situations. Yes, it's completely right or wrong, but it's almost how do you get how do you how does everyone come away with some sort of win, some sort right. of learning? Right. I so yeah. Yes. And to build on what what you're saying, you know, if you think about, uh, oh, oh, uh, for me, just the term to toxic masculinity um, puts my hackles up. Mm -hmm. um, not not the term per se, but again in context, because it's just made its way into into our everyday language. And as Sammy, you were saying you know, what's accepted and what's tolerated is based on what we do every single day. And so this this idea of toxicity and masculinity being put together is just constantly being reinforced. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what is toxic masculinity, right? It's this, it's this belief, and tell me if you 
disagree and and I and I you know there's tons of uh, definitions but it's this idea of what it is to be a man and it's usually around some sort of toughness you know so it's physical brawn but it's also this emotional toughness but tough meaning not resilient or robust or strong but tough meaning no emotions um almost aggression in behavior um and then there's also sort of this aspect of you know for some people um this sort of anti anti women anti feminism you know i don't do girly stuff don't act like a girl don't you know don't be a wuss or whatever whatever that idea and i think the third piece of this toxic masculinity is power go get power get money go after it and all of this happens in the workplace right the problem and 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 it happens with women women also want to be tough women also want to go for power and we don't want to be viewed as women so again this is masculinity femininity i don't i, I don't like that because i think we should all want that stuff mm-hmm. what's toxic about it is when it breaks down right um and again i come back to the leadership leadership today means that you need to listen to all kinds of work that means that people have to be able to speak their feelings people need to be able to disagree with you people need to um say you know i'm really not sure everybody talks about risk and all of this stuff but nobody's going to take a risk if their head gets cut off why because you won't yeah. accept um discussion because you don't want to feel weak and i think I, I, so i haven't seen research around it i've seen research around toxic masculinity but not about healthy masculinity or healthy feminism right um more on feminism but most men i know and i coach they don't want to be toxic um they don't want to be that asshole aggressive person so i think we need to start teasing out and getting more granularity about what is it that we mean in the world but also in the workplace about toxic masculinity because it is a thing and it happens when i have a client i was that we were talking about recruiting practices for their new um ceo their their group of uh ceos but they were looking and somebody said joking joking i know it was a joke but in a ceo or it was well it's not just ceo but the leadership meeting they said oh yeah well if she comes tell her to wear her blah 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 shirt because that's what she looks hot in mm. and right after he said it he went I heard it. Right? We have to we have to let people grow. We have to let people, you know, so we can't be toxic in our reaction. Yeah. If we want to bring people along. Exactly. And That's you know, great point. It, you know, Sammy, I, you know, one of the accounts, the Instagram accounts you pointed me to and and this kind of talks touches upon what what what, uh, what Rose had mentioned was you know, that Tin Man account where it raises awareness for for men and, you know, what happens to men. And this is, you know, in this space of calling men out for their for their behavior, um, cultural differences, etc. You know, this is something that we don't really talk about much because of the fact that the pendulum is uh, swung to feminism, to calling out bad behaviors, um, you know, for for women to be more uh, in leadership positions, but both can. But but the thing is, women can be in leadership positions. Men can be in leadership positions, but it's a matter of how that gets done, and where that where that happens. So I mean, even with the you know with the with the awareness campaigns that that Tin Men account has 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 done, this is something that that has raised awareness for you know. I don't know if you want to say combating toxic masculinity, but at least create, like I said, creating that awareness of that, uh, of where men's place are in terms of, in terms of the workplace, in terms of society as a whole. I think, I think Sammy said something really valuable when you were talking, when you were quoting Amici, right? Um, You were saying, look, a, a, a culture is sort of its least common denominator, right? What it'll, and I think this is really, important because it's important for men and it's important for women because it tells us 
the, the degree to which we will push back. And if it is true that most men want to be included and, uh, you know, and yet we have a culture that's not, not including, then what we've got to ask, ask ourselves is, okay, well, who stops this? And quite honestly, a lot of the answer, I think, I think, Andre, you asked this earlier is, well, like, so who's responsible for this culture? Yes, of course, the leader, but it's a lot about you are. And the only way this stops is not by training you more or teaching you more. Certainly, there has to be guidelines and strict decisions, you know, sort of zero tolerance. But it's a lot about healing your own stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about, um, you know, I, I am watched often when I go into a store because, and I've actually been out in a very nice store in Paris. I was asked to empty my pockets, literally. And that hasn't happened to me in so long. And I, you know, I just, I, I get so angry and I just want to lash out and give us, you know, but I have to do my own healing. I did go back actually and talk to the woman. And I said, hey, by the way, do you recognize me? I'm that woman who did this. You stopped me. And this is how, it, and she said, madame, what am I supposed to do? We actually had a long half an hour conversation. Frankly, I don't know if it changed her. And I'm not responsible for her journey, but I know that it was an engagement of a discussion and she's more likely to think about her behavior and what it had on me than if I just had had an emotional storm. I did kind of have an emotional storm anyway. I'm, I'm that kind of a person. And it was just- A human. It was horrible. Yeah, it was human. But I went back, um, when I went back to Paris two, three years later um, to, to have this discussion. So I think, Sammy, you're right on the mark there saying, what are we as organizations? What are we as humans? willing to tolerate and what are we going to do about it because we need people who see things like that calling that's where i think we can call people out but not in the way that we do today yeah 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 because that's just about getting rid of your anger yeah totally getting rid of your anger and then it, it then people will double down on the i told you so this is how i've always thought it was you know and like you say that that lady might not change her behavior potentially but it was a learning moment and she will remember that learning moment it's then up to her how she wants to act upon it and i think uh, with a lot of the a lot of the challenges in society socioeconomic sociopolitical at the moment there's a lot of angst distress uh that's manifesting itself in lots of different ways social media i've always said is this huge experiment that no one's really signed up to <laughs> and it's just playing out uh, uh where we can be who we want to be online um, which then you know creates these these camps um but i think it would just be great if one of these viral moments has a different plays out differently and has a different ending that where you where people can go do you know what i'm not entirely satisfied with that but i understand why that decision was made so let's for example in in that moment with the, with the and i'm not saying that this would have been the right uh, call necessarily but if straight away that gentleman would have said totally wrong on my behalf shouldn't have done it caught away in the moment i totally totally understand i've totally misread this situation i behaved in a way i shouldn't is not wouldn't have in a normal situation it's not right anyway and i totally own it and i own this and you know take actions from there that would have been a totally different player. That would have been for the camp that goes, everyone's after this person. They just want him to lose his job. Um, you know, they just have to... It could have played out so much more different in terms of the nuance and the context. Yes, he might still have lost his job, rightfully so, in terms of that action, but would have created a different narrative for lots of other peoples to have in organisations, in teams, in companies. But unfortunately not. It's just uh, two camps, loads of hysteria. Exactly. Media made a lot of money off it. Yeah. And away we go. We just move on to the and, next one. And a deepened schism because now we've got, go yes. say, see, see what they do. They yeah. react. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, of course, we've got to speak up and and keep our, because what you're yeah. suggesting here is you got to work on yourself, right? Yeah. Now, having said that, I will put in parentheses and I'm, you know, North, I, I'm North American. So um, race has been an issue for years and people have been speaking about it for years and it yeah. wasn't until people got angry and people saw it on social media that mm -hmm. real change started to happen so 
you know, we're living in a world where so many different things and opposing things can be true at the same time. Um, and I think this is one of the complexities that today leadership has to deal with, right? Um, how, how, do, how do we do that? You know, why, why in this world do people have to get angry and shout to be listened? Yeah. What, especially when we know it's not effective. And this is something that, uh, you know, going back to something you said earlier, Rose, about, um, you know, cultural norms, cultural differences. I know, Sammy, you touched upon it, too, is, you know, as we're calling out people, there is sometimes because of the fact that, you know, we're North American or Western cultures sometimes don't understand the nuances that exist. So should we, you know, should we define it differently based on cultural differences? Or is it just a blank slate of, look, calling someone out, that's it, um, based on based on who they are, what they're doing, et cetera. You know, I mean, this is what we're, we're you know, especially when we're talking about cultural intelligence, where we're asked to keep in mind or bear in mind those cultural differences and how they, how they should be accepted uh, in the workplace rather than rather than not be accepted. So that's kind of that conversation that 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 should play out as well. And and you know, not to condone what went on. It's just these cultural differences play out and how people react or or emphasize their feelings, et cetera. Um so yeah, so what are your what are your thoughts on that? Did I stop uh, there? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know <laughs> It, it's so easy to ask and it would be so easy to give a quick philosophical yeah. answer which we would all agree with the truth of the matter is it's really messy and the sadder part is that it's a, such a long-term solution because it took us so long to get here i would give you an example but still i still think the only way we get through is you work on yourself and you stop your biases and you become curious about others rather than blaming others. I had, I um, work for, I, I consult with a really um, large international um, organization. And um, I remember this call where I think that the, the supervisor, let's say, or this person in, in a country in Western Africa, which I don't remember now which country, um, I sort of got this question of, I'm tired of all these sort of African from somebody in the, in, in North America that I guess worked also with people in this division. And then, you know, it was, and it was just angry and you could see how for years they've lived with behavior that was completely un unacceptable. And what I loved is this, this man basically said, okay, first of all, um, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do because yeah. I see you're so upset and I see you so angry. And I, I know that somehow I did something to cause this. I, I don't, and I don't know what to do. Um, I know I'm the boss and I'm supposed to do something. I don't know what to do. Um, so, so, so what kinds of things do you think I could do? Well, you have, and, and, and this person was very, well, at least now you're recognizing and you have to do this and it, and so it was this thing and the, and the guy was, you could see, he just completely was, he goes, but in my culture, that's not a weird thing to say. Like, how would I know that I shouldn't say that? And I, I see you angry. I understand that I shouldn't have said this. Now, this is in front of, by the way, like 350 people, right? So this conversation, at the end of the conversation, it got diffused. They're going to have a virtual coffee together. And I love that story. Because it's the yeah. opposite. He showed the opposite of toxic masculinity. Right. He showed authenticity. He showed curiosity. He showed he was listening. He showed he was. Now, again, we're not responsible for what happens. Things will not happen overnight. They never do. But wow, what a different conversation that's going to be. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So that's a one person at a time, drop by drop. And it's. You know, that's why people in the DEI world are exhausted. I mean, Sammy, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You must deal with this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a skill, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a learned skill to be able to see that two things at once can be correct. 
And a lot of times we've never had to necessarily grow up like that sometimes, you know, unless, and, and that's where sometimes you've got to just say, yeah, why would you know? If you've not experienced that, why would you not know? And then it's how you react in that moment to that situation. You can either become hugely defensive and combative and use power that you might have in that moment to go, no, I'm right, you're wrong, not in, in, not in so many ways. But it, it's funny because it reminds me of, like, I've seen, you know, lots of children going back to school at the moment, some of them in new classes, and how they have to modulate their behaviour in class in a new teacher, in a new environment, and they might see things and, and experience things for the first time that they don't necessarily like, but they won't react to it there and then because it's alien to them. But where do they react? When they get home. And then they let it all out. Yeah. And it all becomes, and then the parents are learning from it that way. But because that's a safe environment, and that's a yeah. safe environment to go, this isn't right. I've struggled with this. I'm not happy about that. And it almost brings it back to that human instinct of survival. You keep yeah. it all in to survive. But if you feel the element of safety, that you can be open with someone, sometimes it just spills over. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. So as we wrap up, I mean, we've had an excellent conversation. There's so much to cover uh, with this with this conversation. I want to take it back to the basics of, you know, as equity practitioners, as those who are, are in the EDI space, de- you know, dealing with this one aspect of, of, of having equity in the workplace. What are your lessons and thoughts um, and what are your takeaways from, from this and how can we move forward in this conversation? Um, the, the, I'll open the floor to you, to the both of you on that. Uh, should it. I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Sam. No, I was I was going to ask uh, I was going to ask to repeat the question because um, I think I I think I know what you're saying, but I just want to be clear before I yeah before so, I try and formulate an answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll so basically, yeah. Like, what what are some takeaways? Um, based on this conversation that that equity practitioners uh, uh, you know that they can that they can uh, relate to and how can they you know have these kinds of conversations if you will uh, in the workplace and moving forward um, to have a balanced and balanced view of of this and remove that toxic masculinity and of course you know there could be toxic femininity too in this respect. So, and I know that, that Rose had kind of touched on that a, a little bit too, especially when you're dealing with leadership. So, uh, so yeah, so, so that's what basically, you know, what I'm looking at in that perspective. So I, I for me, the f- first and most important thing that I tell everybody is start with leading yourself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Sammy said he was watching the game with his wife and he had a thought and he checked his thought. I think that is a really good practice to get into. It's and and I do that three or four times, especially when somebody like bugs me, um, <laughs> right? So somebody like Andre says, "I love Juventus." I say, "Okay, wait a minute, <laughs> no, but I actually think he's a very smart guy," and you know, right? Because the problem is when when somebody irritates us or somebody does something, we don't actually think it through. We just we feel it, and because we feel it. We believe what we feel right. or we believe what we think, right? And as Sammy was saying, that's a that's a defense mechanism, right? So I think the first thing is work on yourself, heal yourself. But the second thing I would say, and and you know, this is kind of the work that I do, and because I'm I I really believe it is leadership and by that I mean personal leadership, any leadership, you know, what we need in the world today is this evolved thinking. And, and that means this ability to make sense out of all kinds of information from all sources, um, bring them together, have many different things be true, have a set of ideals and values. And, you know, in the World Cup, it's how do I win a game or how do I play with grace? I mean, the lionesses talk about graceful losing. I mean, honestly, you know, that yeah. was a tough, and the coach was amazing. You know, these are people, you know, so so what does that look like? Um, and how do I become an evolved leader so that I'm always evolving? Um, and those are the two pieces that I think, but they're both, it's me. 
the organization can't shove that down into me. Yeah. Any last words? Yeah, I love that. And I'd, I'd echo it. I think it's that um, getting used to take a breath and, and uh, why is that person or why is this thing happening? You know, where are they coming from? What the, what is the entry point? And and you know people call it empathy and trying to put yourself in another person's shoes. But sometimes you, the hard way is learning by having a, either a bad experience or a good experience. But there's also other ways of learning. You know, read books, read about topics you'd never even imagine. Thinking about films, foreign films, normal films in terms of like just that you'd, you'd you'd get lost in but also subject matters that you just take you into uncomfortable places but it's a it's a safe space where you're watching or reading something and, and interpreting it in your own way and you know i i get lots of learning and thinking oh do you know what that's our hard moments from watching the stuff that you you all post you rose andre people like amory in terms of like you know how he comes at it from an angle same with um jonathan ashton lamptey you know really good stuff we're thinking I love that. I love that. It's made me, it's made me second guess myself. It's made me question my own thoughts. And, and it's just that practice. If we could all do that, even if we could all just take a breath before reaction um, to a reaction, I think that's, um, that's, that, that would be a big step. And as I know, it's far easier said than done. You know, I'm from, uh, you know, Arab Mediterranean background it's very expressive and you obviously been in italy and etc you know these uh these are cultures where we're used to expression and diving into these conversations and and i love that but at the same time sometimes it's 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 got me into trouble <laughs> yeah yeah i think it's gotten well i mean even me too it's gotten me into trouble you know just being expressive and and whatnot even just small words that you never think would be you know, it's the norm, but yet there's probably even generational differences as to why you, why something could be misconceived or, or, or misperceived as, as, as something that's offensive to them. So it's always checking your biases, checking in and who you are and how that can play out in, in someone else, in, in the communications. And, and yeah, so, so all of that, this is, this is great. And this was a great conversation on such a very uh, divisive topic, but at the same time, we need to fi- we need to figure out a way, especially as equity practitioners, to learn from this from a global perspective, not only from a global perspective, but also a localized perspective. So, uh, so with that, uh, I close off the actual first episode of this of this webcast, the Global Conversations webcast. And you know, Sammy, uh, you know, where can people find you on uh, on social media? Uh, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Sammy Benali. I think is my uh, is my handle so S A M I B E N A L I, and uh, I'm I'm on other uh, socials, but the way social media plays out, I I keep them quite private, and uh, I I I never engage with anyone I don't know on social media. That is a rule of mine because yeah. you can't do the debate on nuance on social media. But that's my own personal preference. Yeah, exactly. And Rose Cutterlari, where can people yeah. find you? So I have a website, rosecutterlari.com, but I think LinkedIn is where I really spend most of my focus uh instagram and and stuff is all personal private stuff so all right so with that uh thanks everyone and uh we'll see each other next time thank you thank you bye-bye have a great weekend bye you too